Under my current rule set with solo challenges, my current best times are 153 with Mewtwo, and when I get a little wacky with the cross gen runs, Alola Ninetales has a 1 hour and 46 minute mark. The any percent glitchless speed run is at a near unbeatable 1 hour and 44 minute time, and while you can't really directly compare what I do with that, it is the benchmark for an immaculate run. In today's video, I'm going to explore significantly cutting down the time that you could get if you use some official Nintendo hardware, so just grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let me explain. When I say official hardware, I mean, let's say if you were playing Pokemon Red on your Game Boy and you had another Game Boy with another copy of a game, whether it be Gen 1 or something like Pokemon Crystal. This will allow you to trade other Pokemon, and there's two things that this can provide. The first is the new Generation 2 learn sets. You could trade a Pokemon with TMs or egg moves that you couldn't normally learn in Generation 1, but the second part is, is much more significant. Even on a Gen 1 copy, you could just trade yourself HM users. For example, you could trade yourself a Farfetch when you get to Pewter City, and let's say that this already knows Cut and Fly, even though you couldn't normally learn those moves. They're gonna be HMs, you couldn't get those into the SSN or after Celadon, and you can start to see the time saves that would come from that alone. The second thing is a little more obscure. Let's say you have a Nintendo 64, Pokemon Stadium 2, and you have a transfer pack to plug into the controller. With this, you can start to trade items over with the limitation that it cannot be a key item like an HM, a bike, or the Sylph Scope. But even without key items, this allows for some pretty nutty time saves. You could also trade some TMs over as well, but let's get to how I'm going to implement this into some sort of run. The rules at their core, it's the same as always. I can only use my starter in battle, I can't use items in battle, and the TMs for Double Team and Toxic are banned, and if anyone wants to have a little bit more elaboration, check out the description for a deeper look. So with today's video, here's what we're going to do. Number one, we'll have the starter changed with the randomizer like always, but I'm allowed to grab anything that I want from the transfer from another generation box, and you can find that on Bulbapedia. If you type in something like Gengar, our generation one learn set Bulbapedia will be the first thing at the bottom there's this little box that tells you what's from generation two I can use anything there when I get to Peter this is where the time capsule trading would open up for a fresh account and this is where I would use the hardware to trade Pokemon and items over and just so we're clear I'm not actually using official Nintendo hardware in the video but the point the whole crux is that this would be possible in real life now this entails that I'm trading over three Pokemon that know cut dig fly surf and strength already and I'll just be keeping it simple today a uh, Pidgey Paris and the Snorlax now for the items from the transfer pack the first thing is the pokey daw I will be allowing the glitch that allows you to bypass the rocket hideout entirely and while this doesn't really save too much time on its own it still saves time nonetheless the huge thing here is starting out with a Sodi Pop. Now this is gonna let you access Saffron early and it's gonna let you straight up skip the rock tunnel section of the game. And last up, I'm gonna allow myself a single TM found in Gen 1, any one that I really choose. Now I figured if this is gonna become like a style of run, the only way to get a decent sized pool of Pokemon that could actually beat the game in a timely manner would be if I let them pick a TM. I think letting them get as many TMs as they want seems like a little bit overkill, but remember this this is just a fun little video and I would suggest not to think about it too hard. You might strain yourself, buddy. Now given that this is something that I've been kind of brewing up for a while, I've been thinking about it, I'd never really tested it out and you might be wondering, hey, why did you pick Alakazam? It's currently in my top three of vanilla runs. It's a really good Pokemon, it goes without saying. And I didn't want to just go with Mewtwo again just because, I mean, how many videos on Mewtwo can you actually make? You get the elemental punches from Gen 2, very good coverage, supreme coverage, and you're in the medium slow leveling group. So all those things add up to give you a pretty dominant run. And that's what we want just to test things out here. You can let me know down below what choices you think would be good, but I think Gengar, Mew, and probably even something like Kingler that we did in the last video would be pretty good under this rule set. And I think it goes without saying that these kind of runs are going to be like elite. A lot of people talk about my cross gen runs and how they're too easy, but difficulty isn't the main goal here. You can go watch my execute streams or my Zubat streams if you want just a bad Pokemon that takes a long time. This is about pure unadulterated speed my friends. So there's not going to be too much challenge. You see me just roll over the rival battle and we're just going to do the bare minimum here up to Brock. And when you 
arrive in Pewter City, this is where normally just under usual circumstances you would get access to being able to trade. So this is where I'm going to inject all that stuff in. Now I'm using game hook and I'm just changing properties here. You could also maybe edit a save file. I didn't have that work out too well for me, but you're going to see me walk up to the PC here. I'm going to have my HM users. I'm going to have the items I have. Now for this run, I did pick body slam just because to even get access to the SS and you would have to do nugget bridge. You have to do Bill's house. You have to go on the SSN itself. And body slam is actually a pretty out of the way TM for this style of run, but you'll see kind of the routing and how things differ as we move forward ahead. It's pretty interesting actually. And this does take a couple of minutes to set up because what I do just to kind of take the video around it I would like to just emulate perfectly what it would be like on real hardware but what I do is I just catch three Pokemon I manipulate wild encounters so I make it to where I catch a Pidgey I make it to where I catch a Paris so on and so forth and I just change the moves manually and then I just change the items around just via properties and game hook but this does take a couple of minutes extra that give normal runs the advantage and you're gonna see later when we look at some split data I am comparing this directly to Mewtwo's time but we can just hop into Brock real quick. It goes without saying, elemental punches. We have Ice Punch. You could battle the Light Years Junior Trainer and make these two one shots, and I didn't mess around with it. But ultimately, since this is like the first run, just me messing around, I wanted to see how bare minimum I could actually make it. But there's no question here. We get the Boulder Badge. Let's talk about the fun things of the run. And there's going to be no differences immediately. Route 3, Mount Moon, they're going to be exactly the same. And as you would expect, I can walk up to pretty much anything and just obliterate it with Alakazam. So let's just skip ahead to Cerulean. And I'm immediately going to take on Misty. And normally, you know, I've played this game for years. I've played a lot of solo runs. We've been on the channel for a long time. Going to Misty is often a choice. And you would do this normally with Alakazam anyway, just because you have Thunder Punch. And it's not really that hard of a battle. As you're going to see, I'm just going to toss out some Thunder Punches. Win pretty convincingly. Even if we get bubble beamed, we have high special, we can tank it, it's not a problem. The difference for this run with the items that we have is gigantic. It honestly, it makes the routing feel very, very strange. So let's kind of get into that real quick. The first thing is that we have cut. This does two things. It means that cut is normally found on the SSN, which you have to go through rival number two, Nugget Bridge, all the way to Bill's house, lots of trainers, highest cluster. I think you guys already know. So we can entirely skip that. We can go ahead and use cut on the bush and we can start going down. And since we have the Sodi Pop, we don't have to go underground. We can go straight into Saffron. And the significance for this for Alakazam is that we can go ahead and just grab Psychic. Even though you don't really need it, you gotta think about one thing. And there's one kind of unique little parameter that I didn't really put together when I was doing these runs. It's the fact that you're gonna be so under leveled. It's one of the reasons I went with Alakazam because he's in the medium slow leveling group. You level up pretty quick. And I just felt like if you were with a slow leveling group Pokemon, you would just fall so far behind that the time saves might not even be worth it. Now, I guess I'll say this now because I didn't even mention it. Alakazam probably at its best would have about a two hour, five minute run. I think I currently have have a 208 but there is room for improvement so that's kind of like what we're looking at the time saves from the end of the run but we do grab a psychic here we can go straight down to lieutenant surge but before we do i can't possibly remember every tiny little thing that happened but like this right here normally you would fight surge you would go talk to the pokemon fan club chairman then dig out afterwards but since you don't have to dig out right now we're gonna get we already have fly it's more beneficial to go talk to him now and then just fly as soon as you get outside of surge's gym those are like little optimizations that you don't really think of and it's kind of like you just throw it on top of that pile of why this is a weird run to route as for Surge, this is where Psychic kind of helps. I don't know how feasible it is that you would actually lose this battle, but when you look at the end on the Raichu, at least Psychic is a two-shot range, which is pretty comfortable, makes it pretty quick. Now, you not only have to think about can you win the battles, it's can you still go fast. If you're too under leveled and it's taking you like three and four hits to get past everything, I don't think the time saves would be that great, but that's Surge down. And since his badge gives you access to fly, that means we can go out, we can fly back immediately, Immediately. Now, I've said this a lot and I'll probably say this many more times. The routing was very weird. So what we're going to do here is fly back to Celadon, immediately pick up the bike, 
Having the bike and using the bike is one of the biggest time saves in general, especially if you're pretty good at it. So we're gonna go ahead and pick that up. And then immediately after that, I'm gonna go back to Saffron and I'm gonna head east to pick up the flight path for Lavender Town. This is something I also do in my generation two runs to where just going somewhere, stepping into the town, getting the flight path unlocked is all you need and it'll save you the trouble. You can just go ahead and get it out of the way now. It feels better to do tedious things early and not have to worry about them later, already have them out of the way than it does to be like, oh, I gotta walk here. It feels like it wastes more time that way. But when we get done with that, we're just gonna quickly just go in there. The palette's gonna change. We pick up the flight path. I'm gonna fly back to Saffron. Then I'm gonna head west. We're gonna unlock Celadon. On, and we're already really cruising guys we're only 27 minutes in and I feel like we've covered a ton of ground already in this run it was very interesting to kind of see how it plays out but if you look we're only level 22 that's not very good let's see how we handle it the fastest option available to us right now is Erica, and it's not too bad of a matchup. It's a great matchup. We have Psychic, we can do heavy damage, but once again, the levels are gonna come into play. I did test this and optimize this run a few times. I didn't quite get as sweaty as I would in my regular runs, I'll say that. And for this final run, I thought I would just cut out a little bit more and it'd be fine, but you can see here, this is the problem. Look at how low we get. Despite the fact that we can just blast her whole team and do really good damage, I go down to eight HP at the end. End, and it was really close. Despite having this really favorable matchup, we almost went down. And that's kind of the side effect for just skipping large chunks of the game because normally a medium slow Pokemon would easily be about level 30 right now. Now we can get to our Celadon shop buy. And this is another reason that these runs can save so much time. You don't have to worry about vitamins and you just don't have to do much. I did mention at the very start that having the Pokedaw at the start wasn't that big of a time save. And it's because I could just go up a couple of floors and buy it. But without it, I can just go up to the second floor. I only need to buy seven repels because we're still gonna cut out some things. I buy a couple of super potions as well because you've already seen we're really frail. And that's it, like we just get in and out. It's a very, very quick buy, especially as, as opposed to you know some runs that are trying to like oh let me get the counter TM let me get all the TMs up top and sell them and let me sell everything I have to buy vitamins it's really slow and this one just kind of blazes past that in comparison next up is Pokemon Tower and there's not really much difference here rival 4 is always pretty easy and you can see me just kind of slice through it I do have body slam taught at this point if you've watched the Mewtwo run or the Alakazam streams or anything like that you know that body slam is the definitive best answer for enemy psychic type which are pretty much gonna be your only weakness. It's unfortunate that I can't get the one shot range right here, but it is what it is. We have Psychic for the Gastlies. We don't really have to take a look at the rest of the tower. But just remember that I can use the Poke Daw to skip the Marowak, even though that's banned in my normal runs, because it's a glitch, whether you like it or not, despite what the speedrunners tell you. Now we're heading back to Saffron. It's time for Silphco, but this is something that I found interesting that I wanna talk about. I'm gonna go up to the Fighting Dojo. I think the Fighting Dojo is usually a pretty bad place to train. I think training in general when you have a good Pokemon is just kind of bad, but we've talked about how low of a level we are, and at this point, the psychic tops inside of Koga's gym are really oppressive, and they take a long time to take out, and fighting rival number five is extremely slow and risky right now, so if you just had a little bit of extra experience, it would help out, and this is where this comes into play. When it comes to the training, I am going to use weaker moves at the start just to make sure I have enough psychics to make it through, so I'm going to take a little damage but that's fine after we take out a few Pokemon I can just start using psychic and one shot everything so it's very fast and quick experience and if you want to know the difference between let's say training really early compared to training later in the game here's all you need to know so we skipped nugget bridge all the way to Bill's house we skipped a lot of mandatory battles and we skipped the SSN just those two segments alone it's a lot of experience right and you can see that it, we paid for it we've been a little bit frail things haven't been quite as fast as they should be what's interesting interesting to me is that the fighting dojo experience equals up to over 8,000. I don't have any, I'm not going to bore you with an exact figure here. And Nugget Bridge, the grand total from Rival 2 all the way up to Bill is about 5, 5100. Let's just say 5100. So just this little spot right here is worth more experience than the entirety of all of those sections combined. I thought that was pretty cool. Is it meaningless? Should I even say anything about it? Probably not. But if at least one of you find it interesting out there, cool. The main thing here is that when we get done, we're level 33. That means we have hit another damage round in Threshold and we have a 
essentially completely caught up in experience to what we missed out on, which is pretty important. And when it comes to self, I'm doing the absolute bare minimum. I'm not even going up to the 10th floor, even though I probably should. I just really want to see how far I can push the Pokemon. But I'm doing the bare minimum. I don't know why I didn't take the elevator here. It looks goofy. But fifth floor, card key, and then you already know, it's on to rival number five. So there's really one main thing to notice about this fight. It's you're gonna see on the Pidgey out here, it's not a comfortable obliteration one shot. It takes me two hits and considering Alakazam's frailty, if I got hit with like a wing attack crit, it could be danger. And what you're gonna notice throughout this fight is that I never hit a one shot range. Now once you get the Pidgeot down, there's not really much physical threat, so it's a pretty comfortable win overall. And you just have to trust me when I say that if you came into this fight at level 30, it was much worse. I was just failing here a lot. And while I don't really care about resets too much because we're just kinda seeing how far we can push the time overall for this little experiment, this just felt much better and this is what I went with at the end of the day. With Sylph out of the way, I'm gonna head down to Fuchsia. And since we have Surf, we have Strength already, I can just completely cut out the Safari Zone as well. And what I'm gonna do, what the Speed Run doesn't do, is I'm gonna pick up the Rare Candy in the Warden's House. I just think it's really quick. I don't see a reason why you shouldn't pick this up, but maybe it's something I should explore later. But you can see how hard old habits are to break. I still try to walk up to the Warden to exchange the gold teeth, even though I don't need to. And it's just a byproduct of this route being so strange and just kind of alien to me after doing regular runs but that means we are going to go into Koga's gym and this is why I had to hold off on this even though we have such a great matchup with red version Koga it's these psychic types right here level 35 is about where you start to hit those ranges where you can hit a two shot with body slam and it's all important because it really slows you down and when you consider stuff like poison gas disable maybe them getting a crit on something like that it made this part really slow and that's why it was very pivotal to go ahead and just do seal first just to get those extra levels and it's why the fighting dojo was so important. So it's not gonna look like much here. Everything's pretty much a two shot, but that's by design because this part doesn't feel great. The psychic trainers in Koga's gym, kind of one of the biggest walls in the run if I'm being honest with you. And when we get to Koga, our reward for kind of careful planning here is a very easy battle. Everything's gonna get one shot with Psychic here. No need to really linger on this one. It would be great if you could just get past those Psychic types or if Koga just didn't have Psychic types in his gym for whatever reason, but it is what it is. Let's move on. That's gonna set us up for a very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And you do not want to go take on Sabrina. Because if you think about it, we had to plan so much just for Koga psychic types. And Sabrina's just kind of like on another level with the psychic mirror matches. So you want to hold off as long as you can. Something really annoying that's kind of like just a byproduct of being under leveled is how many encounters I get inside of Pokemon Mansion. It's a little bit unlucky. I think I get around four total here. And it does waste kind of a significant amount of time. I think in hindsight, if you're being like real sweaty and just routing this one out down to the very fine details, you would find a spot to use rare candies to be high enough level to not get encounters, but I don't really care too much about that for this one. And I am going to pick up one optional battle here, the first trainer in Blaine's gym. What this is going to do, it gives us the chef's kiss, perfect amount of experience to hit level 40, and then I'm going to use candies up to 45 right after it. Now, unlike something like the Bulbasaur run where I completely rerouted after, I do think there's room for like maybe in Sylph if you just picked up one extra trainer just like I did with Kingler. I could save a lot of time by avoiding encounters and all that kind of stuff. Stuff, but do keep in mind that this run is more like a proof of concept. It's kind of like testing the waters more than being a airtight, immaculate, perfectly routed solo run. It is really good, but there is some little problems like this in there, and I like to call them out as I see them. And it just wouldn't be a solo run on my channel unless we answered the age-old question of if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. You have to ask yourself that every week because sometimes you just don't know. And that's gonna take us straight into Blaine. There's not really much to talk about like, as far as commentary. I just go straight psychic. The level 45 range here really helps out a ton. Arcanine could be a little bit of a threat with maybe like a crit takedown or something like that. But we just kind of slog our way through it. Not everything's a one shot. It's not perfect, but it gets the badge. That's what's important. After the battle, this is where I make kind of a mistake. I made the mistake earlier, but I'm correcting it now. Since it feels so strange not to battle Rival 2 or anything like that, 
I completely forgot about the rare candy that you would just normally get naturally in any solo run, so I forget about it and I have to go backtrack and pick it up. And during my initial testing, and like I said, I had this run really planned out, but I just decided to do things a little different on this run for whatever reason. It's a problem, guys. I'm working on it. I decide to go to the rocket hideout. Now, this only takes like 20 seconds to get, but I found myself just being like one level short of what would feel really good in the Elite Four, so I wanted to pick up this rare candy. Did it actually help a lot? I don't know. We'll see. I'll let you decide at the end. I do use two of the rare candies. I have three left. It puts us up to level 48, and that's pretty important for Sabrina. This fight's pretty bad just because of the AI, how it handles the psychic mirror matchups for Sabrina's case. We've been over that lots of times, and we'll just kind of dive into it in a second, but all I can say is please use Body Slam for enemy Alakazams. Don't try to use Dig. Don't try to use Toxic. It's awful, but let's just dive in. You have a pretty good one-shot range on the Kadabra. I don't hit it here, and Psychic gets disabled, which isn't great, but we get through unscathed, that's good. Mr. Mom, whatever, just use what you got, take it out, not a problem. Now, Venomoth is where you'd wanna just use Psychic. Now here, naturally, I use Thunder Punch because it's clearly a flying type. It doesn't one-shot it for some reason, but Leech Life is such a weak move, it doesn't really matter. And now for the Alakazam, and I'll just, I'll go over how bad this fight is if you don't have Body Slam here. The way her AI is set up, the moves that she has with Psyway, she'll only use recover that means you have to be able to outpace it and you're gonna see here that body slam does just barely at level 48 so even if things went just normal I would eventually outpace it enough to win but also keep in mind that you can see at the top up there Alakazam has a 23.4% crit chance and body slam has the paralysis chance you get any of those to hit and you're probably gonna make this battle significantly faster and you're gonna see in the footage that I'm gonna get the paralysis it's gonna skip a turn and that's all I need to get past it pretty painless I don't want to harp on this I feel like I've talked about it in past videos a lot but using like dig or toxic to stall out the fight it's a very slow strategy it's fine it's just kind of bad and it's okay to be kind of bad sometimes but that seven badges down let's just zoom it over to Giovanni it's very rare that this spot will ever be threatening and the only kind of interesting thing here is I don't even need to go psychic I can just save those for the rival six battle and I can just go straight ice punch here and just one shot everything great coverage move in general it feels really good to see Alakazam have actual coverage and we just kind of close out the badge portion of the game very clean and I think we can just transition directly into rival number six this fight shares a lot of DNA with Rival 5 and the same problems kind of happen here. We don't normally one shot the Pidgeot, but here the crit chance finally goes our way and we get the crit and just take it out immediately. And you're going to see overall that level 50 is just a good spot for this fight because I'm going to pick up several one shots in a row from there. And when it comes to the Alakazam, it's not the same as Sabrina's. It don't have the weird AI where it only goes for recover. That means it's still going to be kind of slow, but we open up with a crit and we just take it out in a couple of turns. So much faster. And at the end, we do have Thunder Punch for the Blast Toys. Psychic would be just good enough here as well. You can see the effective power on the learn set here. Psychic 135 with Stab, Thunder Punch super effective with 150. Really not that much of a difference. Probably be a two shot either way. We take some nice little shit damage from Bot, but we do get through. And now we're just looking at one last little series of challenges. So Alakazam has been dominant, and I guess for the first time in the video, it's probably time to pull up a little split data to see. And there's no surprise looking at the data. The tier pace represents Mewtwo's overall time, and it would be shocking if this run cutting out everything and doing all that kind of stuff didn't beat Mewtwo, but it's important to see how bad it's beating it or where it fell behind. It's interesting on the Brock split, we lost two minutes there, and that's just because you had to do the setup, you had to get your HM Pokemon, which would simulate trading all that stuff over which would take some time but after that you really start to pick up the pace Mewtwo had to do the entirety of Nugget Bridge so by the time we take out Misty we've already gained up about eight minutes to be six minutes ahead and from there it just starts to snowball it kind of peaks at the Erica split with a plus 24 and then when you get to the Sabrina the Giovanni and then when we start the Elite Four you can see it stays really close so we're about plus 19 minutes which is pretty good now remember Mewtwo's time is 153 that's what we're comparing it to but Alakazam itself is about a two, let's just say 205 in a perfect scenario. So we're really far ahead of that, but I didn't want to go off of that. I'd rather go off of Mewtwo, but pretty interesting. And you can see that Koga split 
It's the only split in the entire game that's over 10 minutes. Is that a whopping 28 minutes on the split difference? And that's just because of all the stuff you have to do after Erica. We did Pokemon Tower. We did the entirety of Sylph. We did that slight little bit of extra training. So it's kind of a little bit of a bloated split. But I really like to just keep these to the badges just to make it more uniform and easier to read. But that's pretty much it. Very interesting to look at. And I don't think I asked this. I think I mentioned it in the last video. What do you think about this split data? I put a lot of time into like the graphics of it, the little art style of it. What do you think about it? Let me know. Feedback, always cool. Outside of that, I do opt to pick up the Rare Candy and Victory Road. Normally I wouldn't do this, but like I said, there's several things that I'd probably change if I redid this run over with. But I just felt like I was a little bit too weak of the Elite Four, but speaking of which, I think it's time we fade to black and just see how it goes. And with Thunder Punch on the learn set, you kind of know how it's going to go at the start at least. I am going to take some chip damage here and there, but everything's going to be pretty quick, pretty simple. And you can see that it is, but there's one key thing that kind of hurts a little bit, and that's the fact that I take a growl. What this means is that our already low attack is neutered, and there's no point in doing anything about it. So I have to go for Thunder Punch. It's the only kind of neutral thing I have against Jinx. And I've mentioned the frailty of Alakazam. I mention it a lot. We get hit with Thrash here. And just for good measure, the first one crits. And that means by the time we take out the Jinx, we're down in the red health. We're only at 27. We take it out, and at the end is Lapras. And if this was a series, I will be playing this on my own custom ROMs, the same kind of frame framework that I play my cross gen runs at and what I think this means I've mentioned this in some other videos I think it means that Lapras will prioritize Confuse Ray because it sees it as super effective and here I get hit with the Confuse Ray I don't hurt myself luckily and I do take it out and win it's just one of those little things I didn't really think about if I had to do these runs over again I would probably do it on just a vanilla copy without the psychic ghost interaction bug fix that I do in my regular runs but it is what it is Lorelai's down you know what I'm actually gonna do it this week I'm skipping Bruno. I'm just skipping over him. There's no point. And when we look at Agatha here, here's the reason why. We could probably skip over Agatha too, because even at 55, you notice that I, I haven't healed. And it's because Psychic can easily just decimate her team. The only thing to even, I'll just, I'll mention Bruno, I guess, right here. I had to kind of use some ice punches and stuff like that just to preserve Psychics for this fight. But neither of these fights are interesting. They're very quick one shots. No need to really look at them in depth too much. You kind of already know how it's going to go. And I guess as we're watching the demo, Demolition kind of play out. I really enjoyed the Hurt Sprite for Alakazam. I've been using a mix. Usually I'll use a Gen 2 Sprite, specifically the Silver Sprites for my overlay, and then I'll kind of adapt them to be heard or fainted depending on the situation. And I've really enjoyed using Generation 3 Sprites. And I've really, I gotta say, pat myself on the back. I think the Alakazam Hurt Sprite's really good. Let me know what you think down below. Next up is Lance, and once again, we don't have to linger too much on this one because we have two things, Thunder Punch, Ice Punch. There is one potential worrying thing, and that's the fact that it would take a couple of levels to be able to put Aerodactyl into a one-shot range. You're gonna see here that I'm gonna hit it with an Ice Punch. I do just not enough, and if it used a Hyper Beam and crit, it would probably just one-shot us, so that is a potential reset point, but even in the vanilla Alakazam run, there was a couple of spots where you're just so frail that sometimes you can just get hit with a crit and there's nothing you can do about it so I'm not too worried about it I don't think this would be a point that you would optimize the run around but it is kind of interesting to talk about I guess we survive we take out the dragon out at the end and that just leaves us with one final battle The lead is Pidgeot, and we've talked about it being a potential risk to maybe crit us since we're physically frail, but once again, Alakazam comes in clutch, we get the crit, and we take it out. Next up is an Alakazam mirror match for the 10th time it feels like, and you already know the strat, just use Body Slam. Now unfortunately here, it uses Psychic, doesn't do much damage, and it's gonna be a three shot with Body Slam because we're missing the damage rounding threshold here, and what's really unfortunate here is on the second Psychic, it gets the special drop, and when you're a Pokemon that's all about the special this really hurts your ranges and we're gonna see exactly why it hurts soon I do accidentally use Psychic on the Rhydon. I should use Ice Punch, but 
no harm, no foul. I do get a little badge boost out of it, even though it's not really needed. I take it out and we're not really going to see any product of the special drop just yet because Arcanine, you know, it takes a few hits because of that drop, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We're about half health and now let's enter the executor. Now I'm going to go on record. I think this thing is absurdly bulky and this is one of the single biggest time waste in any run. Executor is a monster to go against at the end. It may not have good moves, but it can last forever and you're going to see that with that special drop it looks like it's gonna be about a four or a five hit now considering that we're at half health look at the stomp right here look how much damage it takes us down to 16 health and this is gonna be the end for alakazam we're gonna have to come back to the drawing board hope we don't get that special drop but alakazam this thing is clutch this is a clutch pokemon we hit the crit take it out and we're at 16 health so we still need a little bit of luck this one's not looking too great with blastoise coming up but alakazam he looks back at me and he says hey hey bro i got you we critical hit thunder punch on the blastoise and we take it out and despite kind of having a rough champion fight that's the run over Alakazam finishes the run at 1 hour, 35 minutes and 4 seconds, which is great. It's a pretty huge improvement. It's about a full 30 minutes over Alakazam's best, and it's about 18 minutes better than Mewtwo. Like I said, this is just kind of like a new format I've been thinking about to where I can cut out more of the game and we can just kind of see more Pokemon do what they do. It's really rough around the edges, and just to be completely transparent with you guys, I had faster Alakazam runs in practice at about 133, and I really tried for a few runs to see if I can get this in the 120 range but I don't know if that's really possible but 135 will stand for now but just know that I did have a 133 time that I didn't record so if we look at the final split data here just to let you kind of glance over it even though it hasn't changed much since last time you can just see the pacing here from Mewtwo and you can see how much time you can save from cutting out those little segments and I think it was really interesting now is this a one and done type deal I don't know it's really gonna depend on you guys if you seem to like this footage we could probably insert something else in there and see how it does but if it just gets like mid views we'll probably just go back to regular stuff i just wanted to try something different out it's getting to the end of the year and you know guys sometimes you just want to try something different this sounded kind of fun if you keep trying the same thing over and over there's no room for growth and we're always about growth here and speaking about growth special shout out to my channel members and patreons uh, i really do appreciate the support i can't say that enough i'm not that big of a channel and just to know that there's some people out there that kind of have my back and believe in the product it means a lot it keeps me going keeps me motivated and if you're new to the channel check out the playlist for the regular stuff this one's a little bit weird to start on but if you did hey no judging any feedback thoughts comments just leave them down below and i do believe this is going to be the last video of the year so it's been a good one hopefully next year's even better have a great holiday guys and i'll see you on the first video of 2024 bye